everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Welcome to the Champions Network. My name is Rebecca Rulier, and I'm here today with Imani McGee Stafford. Imani is a member of the WNBA's Dallas Wings, an abuse survivor, mental health advocate, current law student, and a self-described unicorn. Imani's life goal is to be who she needed when she was younger. Welcome, Imani. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course. Imani, I'm so excited that you're joining us today. Thank you for your time. And I understand you're very busy. You stepped away from the WNBA for two seasons to pursue a law degree. And you're most passionate about mental health and social justice. So tell us a little bit more about what you've been up to and, and those passions. Yeah, so um, I was blessed to figure out like my life purpose at 19. Um, very rare and totally an accident. But in that, I learned while playing basketball at the University of Texas that like the reason I'm here, the reason I tried to take my life three times before the age of 17, the reason I was never successful or however you want to paint that was because like God had a bigger purpose for my life. And for me, I believe my purpose is to use the platform that basketball gives me to talk about mental health and sexual violence and healthy relationships and show like realistic depictions of what this looks like. I think for me growing up in an abusive household, I was sexually abused. Um, I'm bipolar, which I didn't figure out until I was an adult. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so navigating these feelings of isolation, of sadness, of kind of always feeling like the black sheep, um, of being sexually abused, I didn't understand like that this wasn't just an isolated thing. Like to me, I felt like no one in the world had this story, right? Anytime I saw someone that was dealing with mental health on TV, they were either jumping off a bridge or they were perfectly fine. I never saw myself in those images. Anytime I saw a victim of sexual abuse. They were some small kind of quaint, idealistic victim, right? It didn't look like me. I'm six, seven. I've been, I was six, five at 13. I've always had a big boisterous personality. It, it didn't look like me. So I didn't feel as though um, I fit into that, right? And I'm a victim of childhood sexual abuse. So I, I didn't fight back. I didn't run away. It wasn't someone I knew. It wasn't someone that was a stranger, the creepy guy that followed me home. It was someone that was was attached to my family, right? Mm -hmm. So all of the pictures of things I was going through that I saw in the media, that I saw in stories and movies didn't fit me. Um, and so now my biggest thing is sharing my story so that people that do look like me and have been through the same things understand that they're not alone. Um, and furthermore, that there is something that happens after this, right? That we, we can get through these moments and live successful, successful, albeit not all, always have, you know great lives um so like my biggest people that aren't always able to share them um and telling these stories that are often hidden yeah yeah well thank you so much for sharing your story um and i love the piece that you were talking about about the after story and how that brings empowerment to you can you speak a little bit more about the after story and what that brings to your life? For sure. I think um, when I was going through this, um, like I kind of started figuring out I was sexually abused when I got my first boyfriend, right? When I was 16, mm -hmm. um, navigating romantic relationships and I started having really bad nightmares. And that was when I kind of started navigating the process of, wow, I think this is what happened to me. And I left for college. I came home once in five years. Um, and I told my father what happened and it immediately he understood, right? He was just like, okay, I get why you were very distrusting of me, why we fought so much, but that doesn't heal, right? That one moment of I understand doesn't really heal um, the damage that had been done. And I think um, when I first started telling my story, it was very sensationalized. It was very trauma-based, right? I named my abuser on ESPN and <laughs> in national, you know, like I did that. Mm -hmm. um, and then as I got older and I started healing, um, it wasn't as important to name him. It wasn't as important to, to dwell on those moments. It was more important to show people that there was something I could do after, that I'm not this broken piece of glass, right? That, that this happened to me, but it does not define me. Um, so now as I've gotten older, when I do share my story, it's very much centered on me and my growth and my healing, as opposed to things that were done to me outside of my control. 
Right, right. And can you share a little bit for uh, kids or adults who maybe are still healing? What helped you get to that place where you're talking about your after story and you're feeling like you can discuss that type of thing? For sure. I think um, so. I probably share an exorbitant amount of my life. I'm an oversharer, um, and I think that that's my gift, right? That I, I can feel comfortable in these er- in these arenas and go in and tell my story. And it's also like a non-negotiable for me, right? When you interview me, when I come into a basketball court, I come into a game, I bring these things with me. And it's not something that I, I, I want to hide, and it's not something that you can ask me not to speak about. Those are non-negotiables for me. And when people see me, they feel as though they're not doing enough, maybe, or like, they have to be this big boisterous person sharing their whole lives. And no, (laughs) like this is my calling. Everybody's not going to be able to do this. And I don't want you to. My goal is to show you that there is more and that if I share 80% of my life and I get you to share 1%, you never know who that 1% can help, right? Mm -hmm. My goal is just to create safe spaces. And I feel like by me being at the utmost piece of vulnerability, I'm creating a safe space for you to share just a little bit more, to understand that you're not alone. Um, and so my goal in everything I do is creating safe spaces and sharing myself and hopefully encouraging you to let down that wall a little bit. Like I've met so many people, like when I first started doing this, I, I won an award and I worked with a nonprofit in Oregon called Sparks of Hope. Um, they do like after school programs and summer camps for a- abused kids. And the understanding is that most of the adults there have either experienced abuse themselves or dealt with it in their family. So it's kind of this this secret understanding that we all understand what's happening here, right? Mm-hmm. And they gave me an award and I came and after I shared my story, a woman who was easily like 75 comes up to me and she's just like, I've never been able to tell, my grandfather abused me. I've never been able to share that with anyone. When I finally got up the courage, he passed away and I felt like it wasn't necessary to just kind of bring that when my family was hurting. And I just thought to myself, like, can you imagine carrying that weight for five decades, right? Like, wow, right? And she was just like, thank you so much for sharing your story. I may not have been able to receive my closure, but watching you do what you do helps me. And, and it's little moments like that that continue to propel me on this journey, right? Like she'll never be able to kind of tell her family, but she can look to me and understand that like, she's not alone in this journey. And I think that's what it's about. Yeah, I just want to underline that overall message that no one's alone, especially in these times where we're in a pandemic and there is um, racial unrest. There's so much going on for people and so no one is alone. And if you do need services, at least here at Doc Wayne, you can email us at support at docwayne.org. So just want to underline that piece. But also, Imani, you've talked in the past too about how it is truly a privilege to be able to share your story. And there's oftentimes that people can't for various reasons. Could you touch on that a little bit too? For sure. I think it goes back to like, I play basketball, right? Like I'm currently in law school, but and I don't have any specific way I have to be, right? When you're a WNBA player, you just got to show up and, and play basketball. <laughs> yeah. Take care of your body, be in shape, you know? So there is no kind of quote unquote way I'm supposed to look or carry myself. I don't have that in my profession. So that gives me a certain type of privilege to speak about my past and be kind of out there with the things I believe in. Um, and also I'm not an act of danger, right? That I don't, my abuser is far gone from my life. And so I can tell this story without threat of repercussions or, or the fear of coming home to a, to an unsafe environment. So for me, it's kind of almost a disservice to what I've been through and the people that have had the same similar circumstances to not share my story if I can, right? Like once I start practicing law, I'll probably have to tone it down a bit, right? Because I'll have a certain expectation of how I carry myself. So for me, as long as I can, I'm going to like share this story from the mountaintops and, and keep having these conversations on all of the, in all of the arenas I'm blessed to enter because I'm a pro athlete. Yeah. Well, here at Doc Wayne, we appreciate your voice and there's many kids out there who aren't spoken for and it is very hard for them to share their story. Although we try to uplift all of their voices. So we thank you. And I just want to ask you a few questions about sport and where you see basketball or really any sport and that platform it has around mental health advocacy and or social justice. 
I think we've seen um, within the last couple of years, um, athletes understand their voice and their power, um, right? Like I, I probably, when I came into the league, I was, 2016 is when I entered the WNBA and, and I'd already started kind of creating this image for myself that I, w- I was very active on the social justice front and I was going to speak about mental health and be in this advocacy space as much as I could. And I was kind of the only one. Um, and now we've seen Liz Cambage, DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love, um, Eric Gordon, you know, all, all these big names be comfortable and vulnerable and share with themselves and what they've gone through. Because I think when we look at sports, they're a microcosm of the real world, right? So everything that happens in sports is the same thing that happens in the real world, but amplified and on the stage. And so when we see these, these big, strong superhero like men saying, no, like I suffer from depression, I suffer from anxiety, I'm a real person. I, I think it trickles down into the real world and people understand like if this person I look up to goes through these things and like, oh, maybe I am going through these things. Maybe I should seek out help or I can talk about it and deal with it. So I I think um, it's super amazing to see the kind of the tide in sports. Um, And also on the same thing as social justice, um, you know, like I I think we have often been told that you could not have a voice in terms of politics and what you believed in when it came to sports and kind of had to just go out there and play. And I think um, the biggest influence being Maya Moore and LeBron James who at the peak of their careers have, have taken on that burden of, of moving the needle when it comes to, to social justice. Um, so um, I'm blessed to be a part of the WNBA. We've done so much on that front and we continually fight that. And I think it's, you can't remove your identity when it comes to sports and you shouldn't be asked to. And every arena I enter into, I'm a black woman and mm-hmm. that does not stop when I put on a jersey. I'm yeah. now a black woman that plays basketball. <laughs> <You> <laughs> So, so asking um, players to not bring their identity in the, po- in the sports doesn't work because that's what makes them amazing. That's what makes you unique, your, your, your background and what you came to. And that, that's why you care about these different things. And that's why you play so, so fervently and you're so passionate about it. Um, and even with like my alma mater, uh, the University of Texas football team, after the killing of George Floyd, they demanded um, UT to change some racist names on statues to put more black athletes around campus to donate 0.05% to Black Lives Matter movement. And that sounds like a very small number, but Texas football brings in billions. <laughs> you know what I mean? So 0.05% is a very hefty amount. Um, and for them to be 20, 21 and understand the power of their voice, even in that limited scope of a college athlete, is amazing. So um, I think we're seeing a younger generation that understand that they can do more and they can be more and they're not defined by just being an athlete. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for um, talking about all of that very comprehensively. And I just want to add too is uh, the piece about bringing your identity to sport. I think that's what is so amazing about being able to fuse sport and therapy too, is that all of this is happening, but we're also able to do deep work within sport because as you said, you're a black woman who um, brings her identity to sport is that all of our kids are bringing their identity to sport. So we can talk about this and we always talk about sport as being a live lab and just want to say that in terms of just working on this with kids is that they're, they are bringing themselves to it. And so I love that kind of parallel of they're, they're watching TV and they're watching everyone bring themselves. And so we're asking them to bring themselves and it's just a great piece um, that's happening. And so also just um, in bringing that piece into the conversation around kids is what would you tell kids these days um, who are either struggling with mental health symptoms or just watching um, players on TV and wondering what they can do to, uh, to join the movement around racial injustice? Um, well, first and foremost, I, 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 you've, we spoke briefly about this before the call, but everything you guys are doing at Doc Wayne is amazing. Um, and I think it's furthermore, because for me, like growing up, sports were my safe haven. Yeah. That was the place I got attention from my parents. That was the place I got to put a put down everything that was going on outside of it. So for you to add in the mental health and equip coaches to understand how to deal with these things while still playing sports is amazing. And I I think it's definitely something that's needed. Um, And for kids, you know, like I always say, uh, you know, like have fun. 
I think we, we force kids to kind of be one sport athletes and take it so seriously so soon. Um, and I'm, I'm very much a big a proponent of the full athlete, right? Like you got to nurture their entire identity. Don't put your, your eight-year-old in one sport and tell them they need to be great. That's hard. <laughs> you know, like you got to understand that when you take your self-worth, which a lot of athletes do from a, something that can be taken away via injury, via not playing because mm -hmm. you don't fit well or there's better players around you, it's hard to still find value in yourself. So, like, you know, understanding that I may play a bad game, but I'm not a bad person. Mm -hmm. right? I may have made a mistake, but that doesn't mean that I'm dumb or not good enough. Um, and separating those two things, you know, I always say basketball is what I do. It's not who I am. Um, and telling kids that from a young age. Um, and I also think I, I gained a lot of confidence from sports because, I, like I said, I was 6'5 or 13. I was awkward and lanky and bigger than everyone and you know like that's a hard time already yeah so, like playing sports I not only did I get the attention that I wanted from my parents because they never missed a game um missed a PTA meeting but they would not miss a game um so I could see myself put in the work and then get better at something right like I could see the confidence build because I tried to do this and and now two weeks later I can do it um, and that's kind of how I built my self-esteem and my confidence at that age. So, you know, like sports is amazing. And, I, and you know, there's this crazy statistic about women in sports that like, I think 75% of all of the women in C-suites are former athletes. Mm -hmm. um, so you just learn so much from sports. And so, like, again, everything you guys are doing is amazing. And, you know, sports are necessary and they provide not only a safe place for most kids, but they also teach you these invaluable life lessons. Yeah. Last question, Imani, and I'm just going to throw this one at you because I didn't prepare you for this, but um, if you had a magic wand and you could um, make a change in the WNBA or NBA or really professional sports around mental health, Ooh. what would you do? Oh, that's good. That's a very good one. Whew. Um, I, I think so we've seen – since I've been in the league, we've seen some very good changes, but it's still not enough. Um, every team doesn't have a team psychiatrist or a team therapist. Mm -hmm. um, that has to be something that is done. Um, this past season, the NBA started a mental health initiative to kind of help that problem. Um, but like, I remember my first year in the league, I, I went to Chicago and we didn't have a team therapist and I didn't even know how to find one, right? Because my entire time as an athlete, things just get done for you. You don't know how to make appointments and, and figure yeah. out, does this match my insurance? And um, so I think definitely being more in the forefront in terms of having mental health services and making it so that it's, it's just a thing we all do, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. we all have to get physical to start the season. Why don't we have mental health evaluations to start the season to mm -hmm. see what we should work on and how we can make ourselves better and, and protect ourselves in this high intensity environment, right? Right. Um, so that would probably be the biggest thing. I, I think um, we're making strides, um, and I think it helps when big names um, acknowledge that that's something that they're dealing with and that they need help in those areas. But we got a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, and also just want to appreciate all the progress people have made, but that's a great suggestion. And everybody has mental health, so it's yes. not that. Yes. Some people suffer from um, conditions and some people don't, but we all have mental health, just as we all have well-being and physical health. So just trying to promote that and help people understand that, that we all need assistance every once in a while. Um, so Amani, I've really appreciated our time together. If you want to ask me a question, I'm open um, and ready for it. If you have anything. Um, I, I have been thoroughly entertained through this conversation and I'm so thankful that you guys reached out and worked with my schedule. I guess my biggest question would be how do I help? How can we help further this mission that you guys have been following for a very long time? Just how? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, so a few ways you can help um, is there 
there's a new initiative at Talk Wing called the Champions Network, which is what you're part of um, today as a spotlight. But we will have um, a champion circle of athletes like yourselves who are essentially supporting our cause through advocacy and cheering for us along the way. And I would love you to be part of it. Um, I know we're being recorded right now, uh, but would love to invite you to that but also want to put out the word to other athletes who want to speak about their mental health struggles or just their allyship to other athletes or other people in this world if they want to join us in that movement um, to really combat the stigma around mental health services and mental health care and really that message that mental health is for all people and all people have um, mental health. So this is not a stigmatized thing in this world so I invite you to that but also you've already helped so you've helped today by coming online with us and talking to break down the stigma and increase access for kids so that they see people like you who are on their tv playing sports games um, and they're talking about things that they struggle with and also being their voice. So I appreciate you for that. Um, there's lots of other opportunities within DocWing that are a bit more specific. So if you have special skills around technology or if you wanna volunteer in the Boston area, you can contact us at support at DocWing.org and we'll be happy to work with you to find a more specific way for you to get involved. And there's always our donate page for folks who are listening if you want to directly impact the lives of youth and families. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah. Have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you, Amani. And for those who aren't familiar with our work, uh, Doc Wayne provides sport-based mental health services. And during COVID, we've been providing telehealth and our newly launched Champions Network, which provides a virtual space that includes a training portal for coaches, clinicians, and teachers to harness the power of sport to improve mental health for all. And through all of these initiatives, we try to decrease stigma and increase access through um, our work. And also through this spotlight with Imani and other conversations, you can see some of the previous spotlights, webinars, and other um, recorded videos on our YouTube page. And the handle for that is Wayne DTG. And I just always want to leave with the information. If you need mental health services, training, or resources at all, please, please reach out to us at support at DocWayne.org. And um, if we're not the right provider, we'll certainly help you out. So please do reach out to us. And thank you so much, Imani. Uh, we look forward to seeing your future as an attorney um, and potentially your return to the WNBA, but we're so grateful. And to our listeners, we hope you stay healthy and happy during this challenging time. Take care. Thank you.